Welcome to Catalytic Curiosity. I am your host, James with a Y O'Farron with Catalytic Conversations. I serve remote professionals and hybrid organizations with coaching, consulting, and training to help them reconcile humanity and technology, leading to healthier, digitally integrated lives and teams. On this podcast, I'm embarking on a journey of discovery to unearth the roots of digital mastery and maturity beyond mere adulting. I interview insightful and intriguing experts, exploring how we can develop sage-like maturity with intention in today's digitized world. Today's episode brings Matthew Turner to the table to talk about the power of story and how to break out of our hustle culture. Matthew Turner is a British author who wrote his latest book, Beyond the Pale, on the back of interviewing hundreds of successful entrepreneurs, authors, investors, and thought leaders. As well as writing his own books, Matthew Ghost writes both articles and books for other successful entrepreneurs and thought leaders in between spending time with his two children. During our conversation, we talked about his books and his journey of discovering and exploring story as a way to impact others and share experiences and how we in our modern day are struggling with the comparison culture and what we can do about it. So buckle up and join us for today's episode of Catalytic Curiosity. Well, hello and welcome, Matthew. I really appreciate you being here and jumping on here. It's been a bit of a <laughs> running around trying to get us both on the meeting together, but it finally worked out. <laughs> and finally I've been looking forward out. to this. <laughs> Me too. And then the, the link you sent earlier didn't work. And I was like, oh my gosh. Oh no. Another <laughs> obstacle. We'll get there eventually. And we, we are here. So we made it work. Happens. We made it work. <laughs> uh, well, so you are an author. Uh, you published one book or more than one book? Just the one? So five. Five so far. Wow. So give, give me a quick introduction to like your journey into being an author. Is that kind of your primary thing or do you do that on the side of something else? Tell me a bit more about you and your relationship to your writing. Well, yeah, certainly writing is my world. Um, on the one hand, I write my own books and, you know, my, my own content from my own personal brand and my pursuit of becoming, you know, an author. Mm -hmm. um, indeed, I am an author, but, you know, the pursuit of doing more, creating more. Mm -hmm. But I also ghostwrite for clients as well. Okay. So sometimes that forms a book. So I will ghostwrite other people's books, mm -hmm. but sometimes it's other form of content as well. So nice. a lot of my background is in on content strategy and on mm -hmm. content marketing. So yeah, it's usually involves writing, but whether it's mm -hmm. a book, a blog post, a sequence of emails, <laughs> I love storytelling. I love writing. This has been a firm part of my life since I mm -hmm. left my job and started working for myself 10 years ago. What were you actually. doing before? And my background was in marketing. So okay, like yeah. my education. Have a nice is... transition because marketing is all about story as well. So Exactly. Yeah. And when I did marketing, I enjoyed the the strategy side of things like building like a, like longer form strategies where they were taking people on a specific roadmap, which again is mm -hmm. very much like storytelling. Yeah, totally, totally. So there was aspects of marketing I liked and there was aspects that I didn't. But while I was doing all my studying, I was writing in my spare time, mm -hmm. basically just as a form of therapy. Mm -hmm. And it that really was did. how my first book, Beyond Parallel, came to be. Okay. It was after a rough breakup. And yeah, it was just a way for me to get some thoughts out of my head onto the mm -hmm. paper. And it started as journaling. But the way my mind works is I like to create stories. I've always had that as a kid, had that wild, vivid imagination. Mm -hmm. So I found myself getting words from head to paper mm -hmm. and thinking, Ooh, I could create a story out of this. Mm. And that was, you know, the, the seed, if you will, that was planted way back when I was 21. And mm. it just ever so slowly blossomed. That first book was a work in progress for about seven or eight years <laughs> where I would write it, leave it, come back to it, yeah. rewrite it. And it was just there as a, like, I don't know, leaning post. So you eventually and published I, it though, right? I eventually published it. And I so got to it, around it, about 27 and I decided I need to keep this manuscript in the drawer forever uh -huh. and just leave it. Or I need to like, okay, right, like send it to an agent or an editor or work on it and try and polish it and make it the best it can be. And I decided the latter. And Fantastic. I started to research the world of self-publishing and mm -hmm. writing mm -hmm. and getting critiques and everything and realizing where I was a strong writer and where I was less of a strong writer. <laughs> and it was an eye-opening experience. And 
it eventually led to me releasing Beyond Parallel and that was just like the end of it then really. The book was hard. I soon after started writing my second novel and then my third. While I was doing that, I worked on my first like major nonfiction book called The Success and Mistake, where I interviewed a lot of entrepreneurs about mm-hmm. failure and how they overcame it. And I developed this love of both nonfiction mm-hmm. and taking other people's stories and crafting something out of them, mm-hmm. but also fiction and losing mm-hmm. myself in my own world and you know creating my own. You world. don't see that and a that whole lot. Me- of that balance between living in both nonfiction and fictional worlds, which is something that I aspire to and I work with. I love working in both worlds myself, but it's not all that common. Um, no. it, it's, a, it's a different style. It's a different mindset. Uh, and different people try it in different ways of incorporating fables into their nonfiction. I know Patrick Lencioni does a reasonably excellent mm-hmm. job at that um, in the, you know, the business world. Uh, but then you've also got you know the classics, you know, like... Um, uh, the greatest salesman in the world and some of those other ones there's like the story first and then you weave in the nonfiction truths into it in a sense in a more explicit way it's fascinating you sum it up perfectly and yeah that led me to my fifth book which uh-huh. is this one here yep. and it's beyond the pale, recent release is yeah the most recent one um, came out last summer and yes that is exactly what you said it's this idea of a fable where it's mm-hmm. fiction Mm-hmm. Yeah, it interweaves these real world mm-hmm. like lessons, if you will, like those elements. It's really the function of story, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Exactly. We have this affinity as human beings where we trust stories. Mm-hmm. If you think about just books, they're a relatively new invention. Mm-hmm. When you think about yeah, human history, are. for the vast majority of our evolution, we passed on knowledge through storytelling. And if you think about ancient uh, religious texts mm-hmm. a lot of the lessons are built around fables and parables mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and um, allegories because they're easy to understand like we remember stories mm-hmm. and if you're not able to write something down which you weren't for millennia right. and you had to rely on sh- passing it to someone else then what better way to remember it and to make sure that it's getting passed along in the right way mm-hmm. than to build some kind of story around it and it's how we interwove the like, like yes. gods and other like religious figures and uh, mythical ideas and all these things because it allowed people to understand very minute issues or life things mm-hmm. in a very grand yes. way where you could pass it from one village to another and that's how civilizations formed. So storytelling is a bedrock of yes. human history. Absolutely. And it's and, kind and of in our DNA. And so much of it was participatory as well. Because it wasn't just, yeah. you know, there, there are these authors who write stuff and then I'm a reader and I'm not one of them. It was when you're storytelling in a group, you are all storytelling. You're repeating it back. You're re-engaging mm-hmm. it, that you're innovating along different lines and keeping that common thread of the tradition life. And mm-hmm. it became a part of you. So going back to, the, you know, the earlier piece that in a sense, everybody was was telling stories, not just to share but also for themselves. There was this, there was really a separation between yeah. the two. Yeah. Yeah. And if you think about human beings, we are like story generating machines. Mm-hmm. We form totally. patterns to understand the world, start yes. as a baby. There's too much data out there. Right. So we start to form these perceptions from a very young age. Mm-hmm. And all these perceptions are, are like little mini st- t- stories. Yes. If, I see X and it results in Y, then I'm forming kind of a a pattern here. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to build these little stories on a subconscious level to better make sense of the world. Mm -hmm. And they stick with us, sometimes in a positive sense, sometimes in a negative sense. Like our beliefs are basically Mm -hmm. stories that we form based on what we experience. Some of them are positive, expanding Mm -hmm. beliefs. Some of them are limiting beliefs Mm -hmm. that don't serve us once we move into adulthood. So as humans, we're all storytellers. Mm -hmm. We um we naturally have an affiliation towards storytelling, a certain kind of trust. So yeah, there is a bit of a divide there between nonfiction and fiction. Mm-hmm. But when you take a step back and actually look at the worlds and think about how people learn and think about how we pass on information, the worlds aren't that separate as one would Agreed. come to um, gather. And and the line between them isn't nearly as sort of fine. It's a lot more blurred. Yeah. And yeah. It's amazing when you ask people some of their favorite books, they'll talk about what they learned from a novel, mm-hmm. but it's still taught them a great deal because of mm-hmm. reasons, you know, yes. connected with them in yes. some way. It might not have been written to teach, 
Mm. But that writing did indeed teach some people in certain ways yeah. because the story connected with them. So yeah. yeah, Beyond the Pale was just my way of consciously bringing my two worlds of fiction and nonfiction together. And I interviewed some people who personally inspired me on my journey and mm -hmm. placed them inside the tale, the, the actual story. Fantastic. And yeah, a lot of fun to write. It's the first in free. So okay. I'm ever so slowly researching and kind of getting to grips with the, with the uh, second book. Mm -hmm. um, not able to put as much focus in it right now because of what we'll discuss shortly, this idea of hustle culture and making right. sure you don't do too much right. at once. Right. But, uh, but yeah, it's amazing. And I see myself in the future writing standalone fiction, uh -huh. standalone nonfiction, mm -hmm. but hopefully a lot more of these hybrids as well. Because yeah, I think it's I love a great that. way to express yourself and hopefully connect with others. And you mentioned that connecting to others. I think that ties back to, you know, we talked about this importance for just humanity and being human or this concept of storytelling and these shared experiences. Because one of the things that I bring up a lot is how we're so caught up in our modern world with adding information to people when really what really transforms behavior and beliefs are experiences. It's not what we tell ourselves. It's not, you know, just words and information and data. It's experiences and experiences are really stories. And so the only way we can really capture an experience without living it ourselves is through stories. Like one of the most impactful stories uh, that I grew up with was The Hiding Place with Corey Ten Boom and the concentration camps. Um, okay. And I would not want to experience those <laughs> experiences that she went through. No. <laughs> that, would, that It was hell on earth. Um, but by her story, I can be transformed by her experience. Yeah. And so stories have that ability of transmitting experience to other people in a way that impacts and transforms lives. And yeah. in a collaborative communal context, this is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Yeah, it nurtures empathy. I think if you try to teach someone with facts and figures, mm -hmm. it becomes very rational. Mm -hmm. It becomes difficult to relate to. Mm -hmm. Some people digest that information just fine, but I think a lot of people struggle to feel connected with something that is just a fact mm -hmm. once you turn said fact into some kind of story or anecdote mm -hmm. you're bringing empathy into it because you're yes. able to as you say like share the experience with the person who wrote it or said it or created it and it's not just through words we can get that through music we can mm -hmm. get it through paintings yes. we can get it through poetry there's numerous ways to express a story it's not just mm -hmm. words on a page right but yeah storytelling and empathy are like they go hand in hand yeah. and i think once you bring empathy into the equation it makes it easier to digest one but it makes it easier to appreciate and to understand that as well agree agree so tell us a little bit more about beyond the pale and the idea of the anti-hustle and kind of the experiences that led you into this particular uh, story that you wanted to share yeah so when i was writing the success mistake and doing all the research i interviewed like 163 people mm -hmm. about failure so I, I gathered a lot of stories about 163 <laughs> about, yeah, yeah. I, I interviewed a lot of people basically about yeah. failure and i learned a great deal mm -hmm. um and what i kind of discovered one of the key takeaways was this idea that the people further down the road from me, they had a greater appreciation of what success meant to them. Mm. That wasn't always the case. Mm -hmm. They often subscribed to a version of success that was just put upon them from parents or school or society or the media, whatever. Mm -hmm. But once they got clear on what success meant to them, they started to make real progress. Mm -hmm. They started to relieve some of that pressure and they started to be more intentional with everything that they did. That was an eye opening thing for me. It forced me to question what success meant to me. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, I started to realize just how often we say yes to things for no real reason other than we're scared to say no. Mm -hmm. And that opened my world in my eyes to the world of hustle culture. Mm -hmm. I think when we think of hustle, we think of, you know, the burning the midnight oil, 70 hour work weeks, having a side hustle, and then adding a side hustle to the side hustle. And that's a toxic part of it, but it goes much deeper than that. 
we were talking a bit about this off camera. Mm-hmm. We are connected yeah. all the time, yeah, constantly. Mm-hmm. People listening right now, their phone or their laptop or both is probably within arm's reach. Mm-hmm. They may be listening and watching to this while simultaneously scrolling through social media. Mm-hmm. And you wouldn't be alone in doing that because that's kind of what we do. It's we're constantly connected. Mm-hmm. We might finish work at five, but we can, if we like, check emails at six, seven, 10, 11 o'clock at night, wake up in the middle of the night. And for some random reason, you check your emails <laughs> or you check Messenger or WhatsApp. You don't really know why, but you just can. So you do. Yeah. And one of the things that we all often do when we're staying, feeling a bit insecure or a little bit bored or a little bit undecided, we'll turn to something like Instagram or Facebook or YouTube and we'll start scrolling. And what we're doing on a subconscious level doing this is we're comparing ourselves to the people that we see, Mm -hmm. but we're not seeing the real them. The one thing that we all have in common is at every single moment forever and ever, we are in our thoughts. Mm -hmm. So all we get to really see is what's going on inside us. Mm -hmm. So we appreciate how flawed we are, how insecure we are, how doubtful we are, how fearful we are. We don't see that in other people. When you see someone on Instagram and they seem and look happier than you, you just feel, again, maybe not on a conscious level, but on a subconscious level, that they are happy. Mm-hmm. So you're comparing your happiness to theirs. When you see someone better looking, you're comparing you to them. When you see someone with more money, you're comparing you to them. When you're seeing someone who seems more successful, you're comparing you to them. And over and over and over. But it's not just like a one and done thing. In the space of like 30 seconds, you could have scrolled through 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 people mm-hmm. subconsciously comparing yourself each time to them, to them. And so the entirety of your reality is shaped by this comparison. You're always on the bottom rung in that mm-hmm. sense, which you mentioned that this is in contrast to earlier modes of life, even like um, just, you know, 50 or hundred years ago, yeah. we had this kind of relationship with like celebrities, a few people we'd interact with. Even 20 years ago. Even 20. Yeah. yeah. Cause the digital revolution yeah. is not that, Old. Not that old, really. <laughs> it feels old. old, but when you yeah. zoom back 20 years to 2002 mm-hmm. and think about of all the things which are just staples of our life now, they weren't around yet. Yeah, yeah. YouTube, Instagram, <laughs> Facebook, Twitter, mm-hmm. they weren't there. The idea of doom scrolling was not a part of the human consciousness. So if you go back to my parents' generation, people in their 50s, 60s, 70s, they still had this. They still had this comparison culture, mm-hmm. but they only really saw celebrities in magazines with that TV. high gap. Yeah. yeah. And like, if you see, we talk about it, right? If you see someone on TV and they look beautiful and you know that it's someone who's been voted like top 10 most beautiful person in the world, you know, it's pretty silly to compare yourself right. to them. You also have this appreciation mm-hmm. that they get dressed, mm-hmm. they get makeup their entire job is to look and act and be that way. Mm -hmm. So you give yourself a bit of a, a bit of a break, Mm -hmm. right? And, you know, our parents have that, but it wasn't everywhere. They weren't consumed by it 24 seven. It was just on TV. It was just in magazines. It was just in newspapers. And they did it in the general world as well. You know, the whole idea of keeping up with the Joneses, but it was the neighbors. It was people in their office. They may have only interacted with, a dozen or so people in a single day, mm. they weren't comparing themselves with that many people. Not every now, single person on the face of the globe. <laughs> exactly. Totally different picture. We still get these celebrities, but it's not just TV and it's not just mm. on magazines. It's a constant bombardment. Mm. But it's not just celebrities now. You're comparing yourself as you scroll through Instagram at all and going, well, they seemingly like me and yet they seemingly are so much better than me. Mm-hmm. So what is it that they're doing that I'm not? Why do they look so happy, so successful, so this, so that, and I feel like this? Mm-hmm. So what do we do? Well, one, we feel more insecure, so we probably do more scrolling to procrastinate. Right. Right. But two, we go to that default setting of, what was I taught? Well, throughout for most of us throughout life, and it comes down to often our parents, but largely just society and the education system as a whole, work harder. Mm-hmm. 
If you work hard enough, you will reap the rewards. And if you're not reaping the rewards, you just need to study harder. Mm-hmm. You need to work a little harder, a little longer, try a little bit harder. Mm-hmm. So that's what we do now. Like, okay, if I want what they have, I need to do more. So maybe that's buy more stuff so you can see and feel more successful. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's start a side hustle so you can make more money. Maybe you already have a business and you're comparing yourself to another business owner. Well, they tried marketing campaign X. Well, maybe I need to do that. So you just start saying yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Because that's the default setting. If in doubt, do more, try more, work more, work longer. Mm. That's the hustle culture. It's not just this idea of glorifying the act of working long into the night. That's a toxic part of it. But that's just the surface. Yeah, yeah. There's an entire yeah. iceberg beneath it. And it all stems from this comparison culture and this ever connection, which is wonderful, by the way, because yeah. it allows us to start businesses without these massive barriers. It allows us to talk like we're doing right now, even though there's an mm-hmm. entire ocean between us. <laughs> right. <laughs> but there is a dark side to it. Mm-hmm. And it's this constant overwhelm, constant comparison. And that has consequences. Mm-hmm. And that was a big inspiration for me to write Beyond the Pale because I realized it wasn't just me. It wasn't just people on my level, mm-hmm. but we're all human. People who are millionaires, multimillionaires, billionaires, they're still human. Mm-hmm. They're still going to be comparing themselves to others. Yeah. The people who seem to have a greater grasp on it are those who had a greater understanding and appreciation of what success meant to them. That allowed them to go, okay, what should I say yes to? Right. And if I shouldn't say yes to that, then it's a no. And that then allows you to just constantly remind yourself, am I doing this for the right reasons? Right. And that stops you from working 40 and 50 hours and instead working 30 hours, still working on yourself, still spending time with your family. Right now, I want to work on the next book. Mm -hmm. But I'm just a little bit busy with certain client projects and certain other things. So I'm still doing what I can with a book. Right. But if I can't get to it right now, that's okay. Yeah. Because the book doesn't necessarily need to be done right now. Mm -hmm. Any pressure I'm putting on that would just be coming from me. Past me would be going, "Mm, well, there's other authors out there able to write two or three or four books a year. Mm -hmm. So the fact you're struggling to even write one in a two-year period means you're a failure. Right. So right. I would have been grinding those gears to just work on a book just because. Yeah. Now I have a greater appreciation of no. One, it would result in a worse book. Two, it would result in a broken me. So yeah. what is the point? Is there anyone out there placing pressure on me to write this book right now? No. Where's that pressure coming from? Me. Mm-hmm. And where is it coming from? From what's inside me? The comparison to others. Yeah, it's a fear-based motivation. Mm-hmm. And, and sometimes it's not even all about the desire, uh, the, the amount of work that you're doing. Because I mean, I know I was in web development um, before I went into coaching, and it wasn't uncommon for a developer to like dredge, you know, all the way through all of the work that they have to do. And then they'll spend like 10, 15 hours straight solid working on their passion project. Right, because they love it. It's something that's exciting to them, and they, the the time just flies by, and they oh, yeah. love it because that's something that's meaningful and connected to them, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's not about the actual hours necessarily; it's about your reason for connecting to that work. And exactly. if it's and if it's about a, a desire of like, oh, I'm failing, I am not matching up to these particular expectations. Then that's, or you're saying yes to things because you don't want to say no. You're in a conflict avoidance mindset rather than a positivist um, win type focus. Then you are being driven by fear. And that's not something that can sustain that kind of workload. It's toxic. Exactly. I mean, it's a great point. I'm not sat here saying if you have the audacity to work 13 hours a day that you are a bad person. If you're. It would be kind of contrary to the message, wouldn't it? (laughs) Yeah, it would be a bit bit terrible. (laughs) I mean, if if you're starting a side hustle because one, it's passion, it's a passion project mm-hmm. and it means something to you, mm-hmm. and or two, it's so that you can achieve your dreams, mm-hmm. that's absolutely fine. Yeah. But it's appreciating that hustle mm-hmm. 
is a means to an end. In right. the same way as money is a means exactly. to an end. Yes. You know, if you're just earning money for the sake of money, just so you can hoard it, then there's no point. What are you really doing? If you're pursuing money so you can do something meaningful with it, then get all the money that you need, my friend. Mm-hmm. And it's exactly the same with the hustle. Sometimes you will need to work harder than you would like because there's a project that needs to be finished, a launch coming up. Mm-hmm. You've been doing a side hustle. You're in that little awkward in between where it's not quite got enough momentum to be able to leave your job, mm-hmm. but you need to work more on it to get to that point. Mm-hmm. So you know it might require three months, six months, a year of working, you know, mm-hmm. more than you can really handle. But if it's a means to an end, that's okay. Yeah. Put a time limit to it, though. You know, yeah. appreciate that if you don't put a deadline on it, if you're not constantly reviewing it, then it will just become a part of life. That's when it turns toxic. It becomes if an it's addiction. Got meaning, yeah, it becomes an addiction, exactly. Yeah. Because it just feeds this default setting of work harder, work harder, work harder. Mm-hmm. So it's not about work this amount of hours and not that many. It's not about work this hard and not that hard. It's about, like you say, being conscious of it and making sure that you're not saying yes purely out of fear, mm-hmm. not pursuing something purely because, yeah. and not comparing yourself to others and constantly just looking at yourself as this like inferior human mm-hmm. being. Yeah, Because... That person on the other side of the screen, whether they're a celebrity, whether they're your next door neighbor, whether they're someone you've known well, whether it's someone you've only just met, you do not get to see what's going on inside their head. Mm -hmm. The only person you get to see of that is you. Mm -hmm. So you're aware of your insanity. You are not aware of theirs, but they have it. Mm -hmm. They have it. Everybody does. Be assured. (laughs) Yeah. So that constant comparison is dangerous because we're not seeing the real them. We're just seeing what they share. Mm -hmm. And we know this on an intellectual level, but our subconscious doesn't usually feed off the intellect. Yeah. It feeds off the emotion. Because like I was saying earlier, so we we may know intellectually that they have these things, but we don't experience them. We don't see them. Mm -hmm. Uh, And a lot of that is a communal structure or communal structures uh, that don't provide open spaces for people to share their vulnerabilities. That's one of the powerful things about, you know, in addictions recovery communities and the support groups around people sharing their brokenness and growing together, you actually experientially see other people fail, see other people struggling. They're exposing those inner struggles and you get to experience that and you create this deeper connection and it empowers you. It gives you the possibility to, oh, I'm doing this with people for a common cause, for a common goal. And you find success from addiction in those yeah. kinds of contexts. But in most of the online platforms that we have, and a lot of the not all, offline platforms, really, uh, we, we as a society have moved away from a mode of you know, confession, of vulnerability, of sharing in safe contexts to this one upping each other and always keeping you know a, a, a clean face in front of and all these masks and everything like that uh of you know a, a happy face constantly whether you're actually doing fine or not we always have to say i'm doing fine yeah, and exactly. we, we blocks us from being able to experience the inner struggles of the people around us and we end up with this comparison so that's one thing I, I really, really push for is when I'm building communities and I'm helping people to find meaning and purpose in their communities and choosing which communities to connect to healthfully is cultivate those atmospheres and those contexts in which we can be vulnerable so that we can see Absolutely. each other's struggles and grow from those. That's really the only way you can break out of these kinds of addictions. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. So tell me more. So you've got the uh, this a- aspect of the anti-hustle with Beyond the Pale. And so that's your most recent book. You talked a little about your first book. What are some of the other stories that you've expressed and brought forward in some of the other books? Yeah, so all my books, have they have the common thread of the questions that I ask. Mm-hmm. So every book that I've written has been, just been born out of curiosity. So for Beyond the Pale, it was the um, curiosity of hustle culture and my relationship with it Mm -hmm. and society's general relationship with it. Mm -hmm. 
other threads come into it other than the hustle culture. But but yeah, that's kind of like the overarching premise. With my first book, Beyond Parallel, it was the curiosity of what if. It was on the back of a breakup where mm. I was constantly wondering, what if we hadn't broken up? What would my life look like? What mm. would it be like if it was like this? So yeah. it's an entire story based on these like parallel worlds of what would have happened had they met versus had they not met. Uh, and I was literally obsessed about that during that period mm. of my life. Mm-hmm. Um, another one of my books was called Tick to the Talk, and it looks at the sort of final nine months of an individual's life. Mm-hmm. And I was reaching a stage in my life, sort of in my mid-20s, where I was starting to the first time just being curious of my mortality mm. and, you know, the meaning of life and the meaning of my pursuit of life. Mm-hmm. With my third novel, I Am Love You, it was this idea of trust mm. and having that trust breaking because I'd been through a few things mm. where that had been an issue and I wanted to explore that deeper with mm. inside me. And then for the success from the statement on fiction one, it was at the start of my own entrepreneurial journey where I was working for myself and I was absolutely terrified of <laughs> making mistakes. I was scared of failing. I was scared yeah. of doing the wrong thing. Mm-hmm. So I decided what better way than to uh, maybe overcome some of that is to just jump on the phone with absolutely every type of creator that I can find, however successful or not they are, to learn about their mistakes and to learn about what they learned. Yes, going back to mistakes. finding out those mistakes in other people's minds so you don't have that comparison. Exactly, stories. Yeah, exactly yeah. what it was, yeah. Connecting through stories. Rather than just reading about it. Yeah. Yeah, I like to experience it and a good way for me to experience it and to better understand it in my head mm. is to write about it. Yeah. And I can't just write about it in the t- way of let's just get it down in a journal entry. Mm-hmm. That helps me to an extent. Mm-hmm. But for me, I struggle to truly understand the topic mm-hmm. unless I immerse myself into it and create a story out of it, mm-hmm. whether it's fiction or nonfiction. So those books, they've all been sparked to life from my own curiosity, some kind of question, mm-hmm. some kind of fear, some kind of demon, something within me that I'm struggling Uncertainty with. Uncertainty or pain or struggle, and you yes. engage it with curiosity, and then out of that comes the stories. I love that. Exactly. It's yeah. my way of sort of, yeah, greater understanding what's going on inside of me. Mm-hmm. and learning about a particular topic or topics yeah. and exploring it in a way that's very intimate to me. And then hopefully when others read it, it will connect with them. I, I'm very firm with most of my books mm-hmm. and most of my writing in general is I, I very rarely have answers. Mm-hmm. I Every now and again, come up with some kind of <laughs> cool little guide or tactical this or that, that helps. Mm-hmm. But a lot of the times they're just things that I've gathered from other people. Mm-hmm. So I'm not much of an answer guy, mm-hmm. but what I try to focus on is inspire the questions. Yeah. I try to write in a way where it will hopefully inspire the person reading mm-hmm. to question their own relationship with you infect them with your curiosity yeah exactly yeah. so they can start exploring the right questions because i'm a firm believer of you will not find your answer unless you start asking the right question 100%. but we generally just throw broad questions out there into the world in the hope of something sticking mm-hmm. and then we get like upset when the answer doesn't find us whereas if you can hold in and take a step back and explore the question you should be asking mm-hmm. the answer often will reveal itself yeah. In fact, you may find the answer is already within you, <laughs> but you just can't see it or appreciate it or mm-hmm. find it because you're just not asking the right question. So yeah. when I write, I hope to spark those correct questions so mm-hmm. people can go in search of what they need to. I love that. So as we're wrapping up here, I'm curious, as a writer myself and who has aspirations to write similar kinds of transformative narratives, what do you see as kind of the core of your process of taking those questions and shaping those into stories what, what does that look like How, what, what's, the, what's the alchemy for you so for me it requires a little bit of marinating I always just give myself a grace period where I don't particularly write anything down I just think mm. and try to come to terms with it I have a decent memory when it comes to stuff like that 
So I don't always need to write stuff down or record things. Some people do. Mm. But uh, but yeah, that's just my way of just allowing the idea to to marinate and to take on its form. Mm -hmm. From there, I usually will just start pumping a bunch of ideas down on like a Word document in bullet Mm -hmm. form. Mm-hmm. just to try and get it out of my head <laughs> yeah i'll write it down and then eventually so where the pictures are behind me now a few months ago that was just littered with post-it notes so i start to like map it out right. so i can move things around and you know connect dots and things of that nature and then once i've kind of really come to terms about and i i feel in alignment with the flow of the story it's not that it's defined. It's not like it's set in concrete, but I feel aligned with the flow of the book. That's mm-hmm. when I start putting it down into a Word document. That's when I start going, okay, what do I need to research? Who do I need to speak to? What books do I need to read? And that's kind of the process I'm in right now. Mm-hmm. And at some point I get to a stage where I'm at, okay, I'm, I'm at a stage where I can write the first section of a book because mm-hmm. I've I've learned enough of what I need to. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I like to do all the research first mm-hmm. and gather it all before I write. Sometimes I like to do some of the research and then write a section because I know that I won't be able to appreciate phase two until I at least get a very rough messy mm-hmm. draft of first phase one down. Yeah. So it's always different. But yeah, that's kind of my overarching like process it. of getting from head to some form of <laughs> paper i love it i love it that's awesome and if you and have you done more um self-publishing models and things like that all the way through or... yeah i've done so, so my recent one gun pale was mm-hmm. was published by a by a publisher oh, nice. so that was my first uh foray into that side and yeah as with everything i find and it, this wasn't always the case i put a lot of pressure on myself mm-hmm. i've certainly learned to not do that like my vision for this book and the other books in the series Mm -hmm. is to like touch a hundred million lives over the next 150 years. Mm -hmm. I I want it to outlast me. I want to create kind of books that are read when I've been dead 50 years. Yeah. And that just requires constant commitment, Mm -hmm. you know, a little bit all the time. Mm -hmm. So that takes a lot of pressure out of me, Mm -hmm. which I find easier. And it's allowed me to just look at the entire publishing journey as a, as an experimentation as something curious where mm-hmm. self-publishing works traditional publishing works working with a big sort of publishing house maybe the thing maybe a boutique mm-hmm. i don't know we'll mm-hmm. see and it's allowed me to just open my eyes and yeah try all sorts of different things <laughs> see what aligns with me see what doesn't so yeah i've done the self-publishing route i've done a peek into the traditional Mm -hmm. I want to do more of a traditional, more of a hybrid. I will self-publish as well. And there's no right answer. I think every book has its own way. And it's just exploring that. Agreed. So as we're wrapping up, do you have anything as of any final thoughts, uh, particularly for people who are working online, who are engaging a lot online, um, who are struggling with this addiction to this comparison, uh, and they can't just completely disconnect, like say they're working remotely or things like that. Um, do you have any particular questions for people to ponder, to reframe in their own ideas or thoughts uh, that could be helpful? Sure. Well, the first thing is to just take a breath. You're not alone. Okay. Hopefully, if it's one thing you've taken from this entire episode, it's that that overwhelm you feel mm-hmm. to an extent everyone does. Yeah. Whether they're conscious of it or not, we all feel it. We've evolved very slowly over a long period of time. Society has evolved a lot over a short period. We are simply not capable of keeping up in this world that exists today. Mm. So everything you feel, all that overwhelm, all that insecurity, it's fine. No, you're not alone. The one kind of keystone question that I think helps a lot of people, and I know has certainly helped me and sparked this entire journey, I suppose, for me, was this, what does success mean to me Mm. chances are you're pursuing something right now that is bland it's vanilla it's Mm. too wishy-washy maybe it's to do with money maybe it's to do with some kind of job promotion maybe it's starting your own business maybe it's this maybe i don't know but chances are it's not a very defined version Mm -hmm. and if you actually take a step back and go why do i want that do I actually want it? You'll realize, no. 
So then it starts an exploration of, okay, well, what does success mean to me? And you'll hone in on something, but then you've got a question back. All right, so I want this amount of money instead, but why? And if you keep asking, but why? Five, six, seven, eight times, you'll eventually kind of get to a version of like, okay, this is what I kind of do want. Mm. And once you learn what you kind of do want, you learn a lot about what you don't. Yeah. And once you know what you don't want, it makes it a lot easier to say no. It all makes it a lot easier to prioritize. It makes it a lot easier to just give yourself a damn break. <laughs> you know, it, it just makes right. it gives you you're giving yourself permission to go. I don't need to be perfect. I don't need to be doing everything right now. I don't need to be everything to everyone. Mm -hmm. I just need to chill out, slow it down, enjoy life, mm -hmm. and do what means something to me. So yeah, what does success mean to you? Ponder it. Spend half an hour, go for a walk, and just genuinely like be curious. Mm -hmm you will likely find that what you think is success isn't. Fantastic. I think, I think this has been an ideal conversation for a podcast called Catalytic Curiosity. <laughs> yeah, right? I mean, curiosity has come up. So perfect. Yeah. So perfect. Well, thank it. you so much for your time, Matthew. Uh, I really enjoyed this conversation. Um, a lot of stuff um, for me to ponder, for my audience to ponder. Um, I look forward to hope maybe seeing you back on the podcast at some point with a new book at some point. That'd be super awesome. And right. absolutely. And there'll be links in the description for uh, stuff about how, where to find uh, Matthew's books and everything. Um, but for now, I thank you for joining us. It's been awesome. Cheers. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you had your curiosity sparked to explore these subjects with greater awareness or gained a valuable insight along the way. Take a look at the show notes for links to where you can find Matthew's books, leave reviews wherever you can, and make sure to join the conversation on my Discord. Remember, community is the catalyst that drives lasting transformation. I'll see you in the next episode of Catalytic Curiosity.